12 days, folks, 12 days. Although the mainstream media would love to prematurely declare Hillary Clinton the winner, they can't because Donald Trump has sliced our lead in half, according to a new Fox News poll, only three points between the nominees now. Yesterday, Hillary Clinton celebrated her birthday with her pals in the press. Here's some birthday cake. I ate my piece, and I highly recommend it, especially if you're a chocolate lover, because it is really, really good. Must have worked because she sweetened them up before answering these hard-hitting questions. How do you feel about your birthday in the campaign and where you are today? Our new poll in New Hampshire has you up nine points. Do you think you're going to try to meet one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump after the election is over and also sit down with Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell as, as part of the process to help the country heal? Have you succeeded in let, get, get the American people getting to know you? Do you feel like they know the real you? Trump, on the other hand, didn't get the same kind of treatment from the media yesterday. This is one of his last 13 mornings before the election, and he is spending it not in a place where he can pick up electoral votes or a place where he's shaking hands with battleground voters, but here at his hotel. With less than two weeks to go, Donald Trump taking time away from the voters to spend time with his business. He's got 13 days left, and he's trailing in the polls. Is this a good use of his time? It's not. If you were a sane presidential candidate, you wouldn't go anywhere near that hotel during the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. All right, KG, we'll, we'll let Juan handle the softball questions for <laughs> Hillary Clinton. But, but on Donald Trump getting, uh, you know, taken to task for opening his, his hotel in, in D.C., boy, I got to think that would be a good thing. You'd want a guy who is successful in business to take him in and show how successful he can be right. with the country. Well, because you, if you tie it in right, okay, I mean, it's something that he wanted to do. He's not abandoning his business in the meantime. However, yes, he, this is like neck and neck. Uh, in terms of now, it's tightening between the gap between the two of them. Real clear politics, just moving uh, Pennsylvania to toss up. So, yeah, you want to devote all your time you can to those states you can win. But if you can tie in the message and say, I'm a man who has created jobs, you know, built businesses. This is what I want to do with the economy. And this is an example of what jobs has she created and move on from there. Sure. But it doesn't matter. I mean, at this point, if he came up with a cure for cancer, the press is going to bash him, it seems like. Mr. Wine, a couple of, couple of weeks left, 12 or 13 days left, depending on when that, that sound bite came from. How do you feel on your birthday? You crushed it. You're up by nine. After you win the presidency, are you going to shake hands with Mitch McConnell and mm -hmm. Paul Ryan? Wow. Well, I, you know what, I think you have an occasion there where it's her birthday and she's in the back of the plane. And so people are talking to her and they also are trying to develop relationships with someone they see as a potential president of the United States. But I will say this, I thought that she had some interesting answers. Like, for example, when she was talking, I think it's very important for her about the need to reach out to people who aren't going to vote for her, to people who are independents, and especially to Republican congressional leaders if she hopes to ever get anything done. So I was interested that she was, that's on her mind. That's what she's talking about. And that's what came because the questions weren't hardball questions. So if you want to say soft, fine. But I did think it's interesting to see if you give somebody a blank slate, what comes out of their mouth? And in this case, immediately she was talking about doing business with Republicans. Well, you know, and Juan points out if you give somebody a blank slate. I'm not sure that they've given Donald Trump a blank slate yet. They certainly give her quite a few blank slates. It reminded me of, remember when uh, President Obama had that press conference and I can't remember the name of the guy, but he stood up and he said, Mr. President, what enchants you the most about the White House? It was like, okay, seriously, well, I guys? think the view asked him what his favorite color was at some point. Well, this, these are green, things America way. needs to know. Right. I right. do think she was pretty smart on one thing. Always feed the press before you take questions for them, mm, from them. Good. All right, Craig, uh, you pointed this out yesterday. Trump being a businessman might be an asset, not a detriment. Yeah, you know, it, I, you know it's not bad to have a job to fall back on. But you know what? <laughs> I didn't see those uh, those questions as softballs. In that context, those were blistering. Take no prisoners interrogation. They we didn't show you what else they asked. They asked her what what it's like to be a Scorpio, because you know I I think she's a Scorpio, right, Kimberly? Yep. Are you better? Wait, you better? Yeah. And also how how the grandkids are. They went really. A Scorpio, they yeah, did a right. deep dive into her grandkids. They found out that the grandkids. Sign. This is breaking news are doing pretty good. And then they asked her what she thought of the new Bridget Jones sequel. And apparently she hadn't seen it. And that upset a lot of people in the crew and they sulk for a while. That, Is that supposed that's, to be that's, good? That's, that's, Is that supposed to be that. good? Yeah, it's supposed Bridget to be great, actually. Oh, by the way, I mean, it's not like Trump never got a softball question. I seem to remember hours of softball questions.
<laughs> Can you not start again? Yeah, let's no, start. I didn't say anything. Okay. I'm just saying we got look, we can't be myopic about this. We no. put on our team sport blinders and we say, oh, she's getting easy questions. Trump gets his easy questions too, let's be honest. And by the way, you know when you're talking earlier about Trump, I didn't get a chance to respond, but I yeah. will say this to you. It's not just Democrats who had thoughts, why is he in DC at the second for the second time to open a hotel he opened in September? I think a lot of Republicans thought, well, why aren't you in Ohio? You're still doing well in Ohio. Go secure Ohio. Get out into the well, states where you be. His, maybe his message is I'm not a typical politician. I'm not a typical presidential candidate. I'm different. I spent my life doing this, and it works. Yeah, maybe well, I like well, to I just, I mean, I'm just telling you how people, a lot of people. I'm just telling you, a lot of people in politics took it as, you know what, this is self-promotion. This guy, I'm not, he's not even putting his whole heart into it. He's asking us to vote for him, but he's not even really putting himself on the line, he's still out there worried, in fact, that the campaign may be asset? damaging his brand. A, 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 you know, if you draw a line on a, a ledger, a plus or a minus for a candidate, that he's been a very successful business person, you wouldn't put that on the plus side, you would put that on a negative side? I mean, I think, it's, it's one or the other. You know, that, you know that old theory in politics that sometimes what a candidate thinks is their strength, in fact, is their weakness. John Kerry thought, oh, his military record, and they went right after him, they swift bone. I think that all the talk about Donald Trump is not a successful, won't release his tax returns, doesn't support charities, etc. I think it has hurt Donald Trump. Can we talk about the polls a little bit? Um, three points now. A Fox News poll, most recent. Tightened quite a bit. Um, do you expect that to continue towards the uh, finish line? I have no idea. I mean, it just depends. Um, the, so the Real Clear Politics average is like plus six because you had one poll, the AFP um, I'm sorry, the AP poll today was plus 14 for Clinton. You had Fox at plus three, so let's just say it's probably at plus five. Um, but So that's the national poll, and then you've got the um, battleground states, which are the most important, and you see that today, uh, I think Starwalt reported that Florida, Ohio, and Georgia in early voting are really good for Trump. Uh, the other states with early voting, not so good for Trump and better for Clinton. So um, the election night's gonna be worth watching because it, it really won't is. be over early. Well, it could be over early. It depends on Florida, as we were saying yesterday. That's, that is 100 percent true. Uh, he needs Florida, but he's polling very well in Florida. And now, for some reason, when, when they're, they're calling Florida troublesome for the Republicans because the same amount of uh, people have requested early ballots, Republicans and Democrats, and they're looking at that as a negative to Republicans. Because last time it was a, such a big advantage for the Republicans. And he still lost. <laughs> That's, That's the point. <laughs> well, that maybe it has nothing to do with how many early ballots are, are, are requested. I don't know. I mean, I think that this anything can happen between now and Election Day. I really believe it, especially with every day. It's like the faucet keeps dripping with this person's got this thing coming out. They've got this more WikiLeaks. Who knows? But if any, there's so much of a saturation that it's all becoming like overwhelming white noise. I don't know how much that stuff's going to like move the needle against Hillary Clinton at this point, even though some of it's pretty damning. She survived already, it seems, the email scandal, you know, and Benghazi, and it's, it's pretty unbelievable. And in terms of Trump, who knows if they're holding back something to release, you know, last minute to suppress uh, voter turnout. I think his people are going to come out no matter what. I think the enthusiasm that he has on his side is his best uh, asset in terms of his diehard followers. Hillary, I mean, she had a great day today, well, you know, later, but Michelle Obama. Does... Yeah, Michelle Obama had a, had a nice speech for Hillary. Um, does the uh, media throwing her softballs like that, is that, does that do her a disservice? I mean, basically the echo chamber to her? Well, I, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's because we've, we've come to accept this. We know that the pe people who enter the media tend to be liberal. This is why, you know, Republicans always have to try harder. They always have to field a better candidate because they, they know that this is one arena that they are disadvantaged. So I think that, like, the, the problem is... Emails don't beat females. It's a great, the email story for Hillary is a scandal. Right. But people are just more titillated and interested in the scandals and the, and, and the allegations that are on the side of Trump. That's why there's always stuff. Emails do not beat females in salacious gossip and stories. Right, hang in there because sure. tonight Donald Trump appears on The Factor. We've got the first clip. Watch. Do you believe the polls are rigged? Do you think certain news organizations and other organizations, uh, when they poll, uh, have their thumb on the scale and they, they want Hillary Clinton to come out on top in the poll? Do you believe that? Oh, absolutely. I have no doubt about it. Which look, one? Uh, I won. Look, I won the third debate easily. It wasn't even a contest. And everybody had me winning. Every poll had me winning big league. 
And then CNN did a poll and they had me losing somewhat. And I said, how did that happen? I wonder. And then there were uh, other polls that were, look, I mean, I, I'm winning in certain polls. And then in other polls, the dirty polls, we call them, I was losing by, uh, you know, numbers that were ridiculous. Yeah, I have all I the think polls I'm, here. I, I mean, I think we're winning. But, but Bill, you look at some of these polls, it's absolutely ridiculous. Well, that full interview airs tonight at 8 p.m. It's one you would definitely want to see. Now, Juan, this is something you and I argue about all the time. Oh, the the internals, the, the, uh, you know, the methodology on the polls. <clears throat> Besides the, the margin of error, internally, you still have to look. Okay, so they pick up the phone. They'll call 1,000 people, yeah. and it'll come up. Democrats outweigh, out over surveyed, or more, more Democrats surveyed than Republicans. Sometimes the skew will be 9%, 10% more. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the, the country isn't there. The country is about four to five percent more Democrats view themselves and registered, even registered as Democrats. But you understand it's not that they are saying initially we want you to be a Democrat. They're just calling yeah. a pool of people and yeah, then if, the people self-identify. If, if you call a pool of and Fox they, viewers and then a call a pool of CNN viewers and say, which network do you like better? And you have 20 percent more no, no, Fox no, viewers. No. I'm guessing it would, it would be skewed to the Fox. No, viewers. no, no, no. But they're not saying we're calling Fox viewers. They're just calling everybody. And so, I mean, they do things like, for example, with minorities, they have to sometimes add more in and then they, you know, to try to wait do. it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, they can wait it. Yes. Oh. Yes. They oh. can, they can okay. play games with waiting. But let me just tell you one thing that's so interesting to me out of these polls, by the way. So now with the Fox at the three points, right? Fox three. is three point. Mm -hmm. That's within the margin of error as I understand it. So I think we're, so do you say we're even? Uh, no, I said within the margin of error. So we're which even. I, you think, you think plus three for her is even. With, no, it's within the margin of error. Okay, all right. Yeah. I mean, but, but I will say this to you. I thought yeah, we, 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 what, they're, one, one they're of the, yelling at me. Oh, right, go <laughs> they ahead. They don't want to talk more about. Can you guys polls, talk about okay. that during the break? We love to talk about it. In um, fact, he, he always is this a winning me. strategy for Trump? The the polls are rigged. Um, you know, I, I think he should just keep campaigning and say why they should choose him and have a resounding victory so that no one can even say anything about it. And there, there's no issue for that. It's great for this country, for um, our election system and our process to be able to say that, look, we have fair elections in this country. And just in, in, um, despite any evidence, you know, to show there's any kind of rigging or anything. We did this investigation. Especially when his own team is telling Bloomberg that their internal polls match the public polls they said that so I don't understand what the message is of saying that there's rigged polls when they're saying that they're seeing the exact same thing you know I don't like the rigged poll thing he's doing here is because even if you're a Trump supporter and he's telling you the polls are rigged you may not show up right because it's rigged yeah right no, no it's true it's like you're saying why bother and this is the this is I think the most ominous thing that can happen out of this election is that he is telling people he's acting as though he's already lost the the media is rigged the polls are lost everything's but everything is corrupt so don't bother and then when it's over screw everything No, but if he wins then he can say I alone can fix it yeah I can overcome rigged polls oh, mm -hmm. and the s s skewed media and I alone can do this so he wins either way mm -hmm. there you go all right we'll leave it right there coming up he's back the infamous Obamacare architect who said we were all too stupid to know we were being duped on the president's health care law he's now showing his face again what has Jonathan Gruber had to say about the all-out implosion of Obamacare now Stay tuned. Uh, Juan and Eric are still talking about the polls over here. I mean, it lasted a whole four minutes. Uh, but we're going to talk about Obamacare because remember when a key architect of Obamacare admitted that we, the American voter, were intentionally deceived to get the health care law to pass, referring to us as stupid. <laughs> in terms of risk-rated subsidies, if you had a law which said healthy people are going to pay in, made explicit the healthy people pay in and sick people get money, it would not have passed. Just like the people, transparent, lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. Basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. Basically, that was really, really critical to getting the thing to pass. All right, soon Obamacare premiums are about to skyrocket by double digits. The President's Affordable Care Act will cost millions of Americans dearly. And that's no surprise to MIT professor Jonathan Gruber. He says that was the plan all along. Obamacare is not imploding. The main goal of Obamacare was twofold. One was to cover the uninsured, of which we've covered 20 million, the largest expansion in American history. The other was to fix broken insurance markets where insurers could deny people insurance just because they were sick or they had been sick. This had been fixed. It's not a crisis. It doesn't mean the system's collapsing. It's the law's working as, as designed. <laughs> 
Gruber is now the Baghdad Bob of Obamacare. He says it's not imploding as um, the president called an emergency conference call today with insurers. Here's a little bit of that. The one thing that's been a challenge, obviously, since we passed the Affordable Care Act is uh, the politics of it, because there is uh, a faction of people who are continually trying to root for failure, despite the fact that we keep on insuring people and folks continue to get help. So the bottom line is that most people are going to be pleasantly surprised at just how affordable their options are if we can just get them to see for themselves. All right, so Eric, he says it's politics. You say it's math? It's just math. It's not, there's no, 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 no politics at, at all. I'll go through it very quickly. The, the silver plan, not the highest, not the lowest, but the silver plan, the most popular plan, if you're a 40-year-old uh, male non-smoker individual, silver plan, you're paying $411 a month. That's almost $5,000 plus a $3,600 deductible. $8,500 out of your pocket before, they, before any insurance company kicks in a penny. Wow. A family that rockets up to 13000 bucks Very quickly. The Commerce Clause prohibits government to coerce individuals to buy a, a good or service, unless you call it a tax. And that's how the Supreme Court, in fact, Jonathan Gruber called it a fee or a penalty, and the Supreme Court switched Gruber's own word and turned fee or penalty into tax, thereby allowing it to become a law. Cleaning I it up for them. I think you can go back at some point. I'm not sure if it ever will. You can go back and, and, re, and, and relitigate the Commerce Clause. Well, just repeal it. And they actually, there was a report in the New York Times today, Kimberly, that um, many, many more people than they anticipated are willing to accept the penalty because they're kind of used to it, right? They they take the they figure, fi fill out their tax reform um, ret return, mm -hmm. and it's pretty simple, especially if you are a, a younger person. It's pretty simple. You don't really have a lot of investments yet, and then you just say, okay, like fine, I'll take the penalty because I'm, then I'm not going to have to spend eighty five hundred dollars. Right. Well, when you do that basic math, they don't want to. They don't want to spend it, right? Because they're working hard for their money. Probably have student loans too. Yeah. And that's a big chunk. And you're asking them to get to basically engage in a charitable act to support a failed healthcare system. I mean, really? Does that make sense? Did they just get out of school and learn better than that and basic math? Why would they? You know, and why are you putting such an onerous burden? And then you wonder why they don't have enough money to pay back. In that same loan. article, I was thinking about you today earlier because in that same article it said, if we are going to raise the penalty, mm -hmm. then we also have to increase the amount of government aid so that people can understand the penalty and can maybe get more subsidies. Right. It's all about the blob Gross. getting bigger and bigger and bigger because that's the whole point of government is to survive and to let into into it's not about ever getting smaller. It's and it's it, this whole idea of this of, of it being a problem. It's not a problem if it's for the greater good. You can do all the bad you want because mm -hmm. your heart's in the right place. Right. It never needs explaining. If there's a mistake in Obamacare, it's your fault, the consumer or the person because, like he says, you're stupid. The other thing that helps yeah. uh, government programs is that they're so inept, universally inept, that people willingly endure it because they've come to accept it, like the weather. They don't. They, they feel that they can't do anything about the weather. They feel they can't do anything about government programs. It's so bad that it's a non-story. You, you factor it into your life. You factor it into your life. It's just a pain in the ass. And you know what? That's why like it's a non-story. Yeah, it's just a non-story. That's why it doesn't have an effect, Here's a, I have a question, Juan, about how does President Obama answer the health insurers who might have been on that conference call today, who they're doing their own math and they're pulling out of a lot of these states. Um, I could imagine that they were on the other end of the conference call looking at each other going, it's not just the politics. It's actually the system is not working. Well, no, I mean, they're looking at exactly what you're talking about. They're saying, hey, who's signing up, who's not signing up? They're making profit and loss judgments. The question is, was, what was this plan des, uh, you know, designed to do? And that's what you heard from Jonathan Gruber. Gruber said it was intended to insure more people who didn't have insurance, and there are 20 million people who have insurance who didn't. And it was intended to do things like prevent ben, the, the cost, insurance company. I'm sorry? But bend the cost curve down. I mean, right. that's what they said right. it so would do. He also makes the case, and this is accurate, that the premiums on these plans for people who qualify actually came in lower initially and now are just back to the point where they thought they would be. But the point that I was going to make to Eric's, uh, what Eric had said was that Gruber is now arguing that you should raise 
tax fee penalty, whatever you want to call it, be and force more people yeah. into yeah. the market, can, Dana. Can I just throw this out? I know we want to get, but my niece is a UPS driver. Okay. She makes $13 an hour. She makes okay. $19.50 an hour with overtime. She's doing some overtime, and she literally said, if I take a little bit more overtime, I'm going to get kicked in to this fee, this extra tax. And she's like, I can't take the overtime. They're forcing people not to work harder. So then how does she get insurance then if she's... She's on Obamacare. She's on Obamacare. She's yeah. on Obamacare. How ironic that she has a bad package and she works for UPS. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but don't forget, wow. again, and Gruber and the president yeah. made this point that, you know, the people who qualify, it's 85% <laughs> of them who, who get subsidies, they will see no increase. Right. But the... the pr exactly. <laughs> right. Well, Michael Moore is sounding the alarm bells to his fellow Democrats and any undecided voters nationwide. Trump's election is going to be the biggest f you ever recorded in human history. And it will feel good for a day, yeah, maybe a week, possibly a month. Well, the far left filmmaker is, of course, for Hillary, but he predicts Donald Trump is going to come out on top on November 8th in his new documentary, Trump Land. Why, you ask? Because the Republican nominee's message has deeply resonated with so many voters. Whether Trump means it or not, kind of irrelevant because he's saying the things to people who are hurting. And it's why every beaten down, nameless, forgotten, working stiff who used to be part of what was called the middle class loves Trump. Greg, I see you nodding in well, agreement. Well, yeah, um, it's it, powerful stuff. And it's it's odd because he looks so much like large Marge from Pee Wee's Big Adventure. <laughs> oh, that new God. hairstyle. Anyway, um, you know what he's doing, which I find really he's saying something pretty powerful it's the opposite of what's happening in the republican party when you read like amanda carpenter's last piece about republican women michael moore is saying the democratic party is losing millions of angry men the working stiff the democrats are losing millions of angry men it's the yin to the yang of the republicans losing millions of angry women it's exactly the same problem but mm -hmm. in reverse um and he's not by the way he's not what's what he's doing which is very, very smart. That is different from what Bill Clinton has said and what Hillary said. Bill Clinton called them rednecks. Hillary called them deplorables. What more is he's not he's not condemning the support. He doesn't like the candidate. He's condemning Trump, but he's not condemning Trump's supporters, which is actually which is a very important thing to say. He's a smart fella, even though I disagree with almost everything he said, because remember, he said he also said, if you vote for Trump, you're a legal terrorist or you're supporting legal terrorism. I wonder if you'd like to take that back. What? Yes, yeah, yeah. maybe. What is call? recent? Text him after the show. All right, Dana, what do you mean? Well, he might have a chance to take it back if he wants to, because I just found out he's going to be on Megyn Kelly's show tonight at 9 p.m., so she'll have a chance to talk to him. I think if he wants to make himself feel better about the election result, he should look at uh, Larry Sabato. So if you're a Republican, it was depressing, because this morning in uh, Crystal Ball, which is his electoral college ratings, he holds steady and says Hillary Clinton at 352 electoral votes, Trump at 173. Um, and so... I think I, I wonder if this is a little bit of a scare tactic for Democrats. Yes, I agree on the messaging. Don, Donald Trump has absolutely done that. Republicans are accused of, and they were rightly to be accused of, ignoring those voters. Now the Democrats are at risk of doing the same thing. And then, for, to your point, from an economics perspective, the big vision as to what happens in the country with this big technological revolution, where the jobs go, everybody needs to that's not focus a on helping those people. That's not a news story. Right. The, lo the loss of jobs through automation. That's not a news story. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right, Bowling, what's going on here? So I, I think he is, he is right. I think he's right that there are a lot of people who feel that their voice is not being heard in, in Washington. But guess what? It happened on the Democrat side, too. It was the Bernie Sanders supporters. Yep. Only Hillary Clinton happened to beat him out. And as these WikiLeaks, we find out some of the methods that they used <laughs> to, to, to win that, they were that aligned, nomination. DWS but, but it does famous. make a point. Look, Donald Trump is definitely tapping into some anger and some people who are, feel that they've been ignored. And, and, yeah. that, and I think that's a good thing. If there is an opportunity for Trump, it would be tap into that on the Democrat side and say, you know, it's not just them. It's it's you as well. Democrats come. I am the outsider. I'm not the, the, the business as usual, as Michael Moore po points out. By the way, I'd say the biggest F you wouldn't be Donald Trump winning the presidency. It would probably be the, I don't know, the American Revolution. Remember when we did that? 13 yeah. colonies said, F you, British, we'll, we'll, we got this. Remember that? I do. Yeah. All right, Juan, <laughs> right. what do you think about Michael Moore? What's he up to? Well, I, I suspect that what Dana said is true, that he's, you know, it's a way of avoiding complacency and also 
what reminds me of is that Vice President Biden on the Democratic side has been saying, you know mm -hmm. what, one of the last things he wants to do is make sure Democrats don't forget working class people. Don't think that they have lost that constituency for yeah. all time. So I think everybody's aware of that. The question is, you know, if you are willing, and this is what, by the way, Michael Moore ultimately concludes, because what's so fascinating is the far right has has taken to a Michael Moore movie, which to me is mind boggling. But the reason they take to it is because they play some of the segments like what we saw. But he goes on then beyond what everybody on the right is watching to praise Hillary Clinton and say she's much better than he ever thought in the past when he wouldn't support her. He thinks that she knows how to solve problems for America. But that's hypocritical, though. But, you know, why? Is why, is, why are the Democrats losing males? Because from the liberal perspective, the, the worst thing you can be is a white male. You are, you are obviously a bigot. You're obviously sexist. You're crude. You have to be a sensitive new age leftist if, you are, if, if you're a male or you're done. Right. Oh, I don't. Otherwise, you're responsible for their list of grievances. Yeah. Yes. All right. We so have that to leave resonates. Okay. All right. I guess. Next, Justice Clarence Thomas on the political standoff over Supreme Court nominations. His rare remarks next. Stay with us. It's very rare to hear Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas speak from the bench, but the conservative magistrate spoke publicly yesterday in Washington. The Heritage Foundation invited him to celebrate his 25 years on the bench, and he had some very strong words for the current state of our government. He thinks it's broken. I think that we have become very comfortable with not thinking things through and debating things. I think that we have decided that rather than confront the disagreements and the differences of opinion, we'll just simply annihilate the person who disagrees with me. Um, I don't think that's going to work. At some point, we have got to recognize that we're destroying our institutions and we're undermining our institutions. I thought that was on target. The justice was responding to a question about the high court's confirmation process. He didn't mention the stall nomination of Merrick Garland, but Kimberly, you can't help but think about what happened to him 25 years ago that, you know, of course. he personally was so vilified. He really was, and he's proved himself to be uh, a very capable uh, justice, you know, someone who is um, greatly admired, a good man, a hard worker. We're very lucky to have him, but you saw that. It was just almost just, you know, politics of like personal destruction, trying to ruin a man who has uh, accomplished a great deal, you know, in his life. And so, and he doesn't speak, I mean, you very rarely hear from Justice Thomas, right? So the fact that we're hearing from him is kind of a very unique opportunity to get some insight um, into a man who's obviously lived a very uh, fascinating life on the bench. So now, Eric, we come up to a moment where, again, you know, we're stuck. Uh, we, Merrick Garland's there. The question is what happens, let's say, if you get a, a liberal like uh, uh, Hillary Clinton in the White House and she nominates a liberal justice. Senator McCain, Senator Cruz, they're saying we won't consider even putting anybody on the bench. Merrick Garland, in, prior to her being sworn in, yeah. <laughs> maybe they should rethink that yeah. if, if, if Trump doesn't win the election, because he may be the best choice going forward. Um, but they just say they wouldn't put I, anybody. Well, you know, they can say that now, and they may change their mind. Oh, I mean, okay. the, the nomination's still there. They can still take it up, yeah. I, I would assume. They, and they, they're probably just saying that, but because they don't want to acknowledge a Hillary Clinton presidency. Let, let's just, they're probably going forward with, hey, Trump's going to win. But I will tell you, um, don't leave, Clarence. <laughs> Please don't retire. Because we are really in trouble if, you, if you don't help fix the broken institutions in D.C. Wow, Dana? Well, one thing we didn't show, or I, and I don't know if he talked about it, but um, when Anton and Scalia died, there was reporting about the court and the friendships that are, that are behind the scenes right. and that they all actually really get along, that they have Dinner common together. cause and that they enjoy each other's intellectual capabilities. And for the right, the writings of Clarence Thomas are amazing. It's good to hear from him. But if you, I would assume Kimberly would yeah. agree that from a legal standpoint, it's, he's one of the best writers that we have. Um, and Juan, it was your son, Rafi Williams, who wrote a piece about the new African-American museum that doesn't celebrate him in any way. Uh, in Washington, D.C., which is a real shame. Can you do I, something I, about that? I, I would like <laughs> to do something about that. I know the people over there, and, you know, I just can't understand it because one of the arguments I read today was that, oh, well, actually, in the post-civil rights area, he's, he's certainly an important voice of Africa. I think he, in terms of American history, 
This is one of the most important African Americans of all. I'm saying this yeah. as his friend, so if you want to write me and complain, but I, it's what I think, and I'm and he and I disagree on a whole lot of stuff. Greg, well, uh, white liberal guilt turns into open hatred when faced with a black conservative. That's, I mean, yeah. uh, Thomas remains proof that the mainstream media. Uh, there's only one kind of acceptable black man. It's the black man who, who agrees with everything in the mainstream media. So that eliminates uh, Justice Thomas. But the one thing you brought up, which is very important, and we talk about it a lot, is this polarization. Mm -hmm. Unity is dead. I mean, I don't know how we, we talk about unifying a country. I don't believe it's possible. We bought we've we have these balkanized buckets of knowledge now on the Internet where if we want to go and find something that agrees with us, we can go. We can bypass everybody and go to one website and find that thing that makes us feel comfortable. Everybody does that. People on the left, people on the right, libertarians. We find the comfortable little strain and we stay in it and we never have to talk to anybody again. You know, that's a scary. Re that's really lamentable. Anyway, stay Is right it? there. <laughs> we'll show you some of what happened today on the campaign trail. That's next. I'm going to do that, Kimberly. I won't do that. Not anymore. <laughs> Wondering what happened today on the trail? Hillary Clinton, you know her, campaigned for the first time with the first lady. And Trump's had enough. I think we've had enough of the Clintons in all fairness. Right? Hillary Clinton is the most corrupt person ever to seek the office of the presidency. Dignity and respect for women and girls is also on the ballot in this election. I want to thank our First Lady for her eloquent, powerful defense of that basic value. Hillary doesn't play. She has more experience and exposure to the presidency than any candidate in our lifetime. Yes, more than Barack, more than Bill. So she is absolutely ready to be commander in chief on day one. And yes, she happens to be a woman. Kimberly, how yeah. interesting is it that Hillary is speaking in front of stripes when she should be wearing them? In Lock prison. her up. Yes. Lock her up. <laughs> oh, that pleases me. Okay. Um, I thought Michelle Obama was fantastic. And when you saw the crowd, they were super excited. She's a great speaker. She's confident, smart, talented woman. Listen, it, it seemed like, well, that sounds like somebody could be running for office and would be electable. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Now, she made one uh, misstep when she says Hillary doesn't play. Hillary does. Pay. Play. <laughs> mm -hmm. Juan, thoughts, feelings, emotions? Well, I'm just surprised. I'm really surprised that at Michelle Obama has become a star in this cycle. I mean, she's the number one surrogate right now. Why are you now. surprised? Because I didn't think that she was really going to get involved. And also... she's a woman, Juan? No, because... A black firstly, woman? <laughs> you make me sick. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> no, go ahead. No, no, no. If I can make you sick, I'm thinking, wow, I, I, I must be saying something. Somebody gets, somebody gets some Eric, Obama do I get care. credit for that? No, I think it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> she, she was so capable. I mean, you could actually see a future in politics for Michelle Obama. She was fantastic. Many yeah, but I don't think she wants one. In the last th two or three it. days, we've had Elizabeth Warren outshining Hillary Clinton and, and Michelle right. Obama outshining Hillary Clinton. So I looked it up. Yes, former presidents or outgoing presidents have campaigned for their chosen successor. Mm -hmm. But first time ever in this election, the first time a president has ever brought the successor on Air Force One. Mm -hmm. Now, 180000 bucks an hour. I'm not sure that 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 place that should play well. That's a good point, Dana. Do you? Th I mean, it's kind of amazing what the first lady did. Given that, does she? Do they really get along? Was that amazing acting? I mean, you know what's behind the scenes. Don't they must hate each other, right? I, I, I don't know. Oh no, there's there's somebody else that is a guest on the network that will tell you all sorts of things like that. I'm not going to be one of them because I, I don't know what their relationship is. Does, and plus, does that I'll person rhyme <laughs> with. Juan Bolton? No, it doesn't. Oh, okay. It doesn't, actually. Um, <laughs> what? Hillary Clinton is able to do something that's not easy for somebody in a leadership position, and that is to take a step back and let other people speak for her. As um, Eric was saying, Elizabeth Warren rallied the crowd the other day. Joe Biden does it for her in Pennsylvania. Michelle Obama, most valuable surrogate of the campaign trail. Trump doesn't need any. He is his most valuable surrogate. He's the wow. Well, I don't know if, I don't think Michelle Obama will go into politics, but I could see something that you haven't heard yet. Supreme Court? Obama TV. Oh. Very nice. Yes. <laughs> little competition. I could see Supreme Court justice. That's what I could see. Okay. Or maybe president of the UN. Or maybe the world. Why not president He's of not the world? He's not going to want to be Supreme Court justice. Yeah. Takes up too much time. There's mm. no dough in it. I Wait, just, are you talking about him or her? Her. Oh, that's uh, what I, I, Either I, one. Oh, I thought you said he. That's why. I was, either one. Any, any job where I you listen, can wear a robe. 
Let's go. <laughs> I like it. I mean, I've been looking for that. God, I still have that on my phone. It's so disturbing. A <laughs> yes. uh, picture sad. of me in a robe. Okay, one more thing is up next. Sorry. Short robe. No. Time for one more thing. Uh, who's up first? Data. Um, well, you know I love the World Series. Yes, and I did do. my one more thing yesterday, and I have one today, because an Ohio University student named Charlie got a surprise from his dad earlier in the week. He got tickets to Game 1 of the World Series in Cleveland for Charlie and his brother. The only problem, Charlie had class that night, so he checked into class, gave his homework to somebody else to turn in, and he left and went to the game. Problem is, the professor took attendance at the end of class. And so he got a little email that said, excuse me, uh, you weren't there. Uh, What's going on here? So the kid very smartly sent back an explanation. To be completely honest, I came and, and uh, basically I got to go to the game, and the professor said, that looks like an impeccable excuse, no repercussions, go try. There you so go. So that was a good go. excuse. Good thing he wasn't in Chicago at the time. I think they should both be arrested. There you go. Greg. Yes, uh, I haven't done this in a while, a banned phrase. By banned phrase, in the tank. <laughs> now, whenever you criticize somebody, let's say you criticize Trump, then somebody goes, oh, you're in the tank for Hillary. <laughs> or if you criticize Hillary, they go, oh, you're in the tank for Trump. Or if you're at a restaurant trying to steal a lobster, they're like, get out of the tank. <laughs> Oh my God. This emotional response, which is what it is, it's a baby response, prevents you from, from exercising the engine of criticism that helps you like frame your arguments. You shouldn't be scared of people disagreeing with you. You should embrace it. It makes you a better person. Can we hashtag tonight baby response to everybody who Baby us? response. Oh, baby you're in the response. tank. Oh, my goodness. Oh, you're in the tree. <laughs> you're the tree. I'm in the tree. Yeah, you always are in the tree. Okay, so um, in other news with no animation... Uh, wow. here's my one more thing. So this is funny. So sometimes women try to to her, and they also are trying to develop relationships with someone they see as a potential president of the United States. But I will say this: I thought that she had some interesting answers. Like for example, when she was talking, I think it's very important for her about the need to reach out to people who aren't going to vote for her, to people who are independents, and especially to Republican congressional leaders if she hopes to ever get anything done. So I was interested that she was, that's on her mind. That's what she's talking about. And that's what came because the questions weren't hardball questions. So if you want to say soft, fine. But I did think it's interesting to see if you give somebody a blank slate, what comes out of their mouth. And in this case, immediately she was talking about doing business with Republicans. Well, you know, and Juan points out if you give somebody a blank slate. I'm not sure that they've given Donald Trump a blank slate yet. They certainly give her quite a few blank slates. It reminded me of, do you remember when uh, President Obama had that press conference and I can't remember the name of the guy but he stood up and he said, Mr. President, what enchants you the most about the White House? And it was like, because well, because you, if you tie it in right, okay, I mean, it's something that he wanted to do. He's not abandoning his business in the meantime. However, yes, he, this is like neck and neck uh, in terms of now it's tightening between the gap between the two of them. Real clear politics, just moving uh, Pennsylvania to toss up. So, yeah, you want to devote all your time you can to those states you can win. But if you can tie in the message and say, I'm a man who has created jobs, you know, built businesses. This is what I want to do with the economy, and this is an example of what jobs has she created and move on from there, sure. But it doesn't matter. I mean, at this point, if he came up with the cure for cancer, the press is going to bash him, it seems like. Mr. Wan, a couple of, couple of weeks left, 12 or 13 days left, depending on when that, that sound bite came from. How do you feel on your birthday? You crushed it. You're up by nine. After you win the presidency, are you going to shake hands with Mitch McConnell and mm -hmm. Paul Ryan? Wow. Well, I, you know what, I think you have an occasion there where it's her birthday and she's in the back of the plane. And so people are talking. Twelve days, folks, twelve days. Although the mainstream media would love to prematurely declare Hillary Clinton the winner, they can't because Donald Trump has sliced our lead in half, according to a new Fox News poll. Only three points between the nominees now. Yesterday, Hillary Clinton celebrated her birthday with her pals in the press. Here's some birthday cake. I ate my piece. And I highly recommend it, especially if you're a chocolate lover, because it is really, really good. Must have worked because she sweetened them up before answering these hard-hitting questions. How do you feel about your birthday in the campaign and where you are today? Our new poll in New Hampshire has you up nine points. Do you think you're going to try to meet one-on-one -on -one with Donald Trump? after the election is over and also sit down with Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell as, as part of the process to help the country heal. Have you succeeded in let it get the American people getting to know you? Do you feel like they know the real you? Trump, on the other hand, didn't get the same kind of treatment from the media yesterday. 
This is one of his last 13 mornings before the election, and he is spending it not in a place where he can pick up electoral votes or a place where he's shaking hands with battleground voters, but here at his hotel. With less than two weeks to go, Donald Trump taking time away from the voters to spend time with his business. He's got 13 days left, and he's trailing in the polls. Is this a good use of his time? It's not. If you were a sane presidential candidate, you wouldn't go anywhere near that hotel during the presidential campaign. Mm -hmm. All right, KG, we'll, we'll let Juan handle the softball questions for Hillary Clinton. But <laughs> but on Donald Trump getting, uh, you know, taken to task for opening his, his hotel in, in D.C., boy, I got to think that would be a good thing. You'd want a guy who is successful in business to take him in and show how successful he can be. Right. With a, okay, seriously, well, I think the view asked him what his favorite color was at some point. Well, this, these green, are things right? America needs to know. Right. I do think she was pretty smart on one thing. Always feed the press before you take questions for them, mm, from them. Good. All right, Greg, uh, you pointed this out yesterday. Trump being a businessman might be an asset, not a detriment. Yeah, you know, it, I, you know it's not bad to have a job to fall back on. But you know <laughs> what? I, I didn't see those, uh, those questions as softballs. In that context, those were blistering, take no prisoners <laughs> interrogation. They, we didn't show you what else they asked. They asked her what, what it's like to be a Scorpio. Because, you know, I, I think she's a Scorpio, right, Kimberly? Yep. Are you better? Way better. Now. And also, how how the grandkids are? They went really. Scorpio. They yeah, did a right. deep dive into her grandkids. But they found out that the grandkids. Time. This is breaking news. Are doing pretty good. And then they asked her what she <laughs> thought of the new Bridget Jones sequel. And apparently, she hadn't seen it. And that upset a lot of people.